welcome to the final episode of our series on the psychology of the Fountainhead characters. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Shoshana and Andy, who I hope you've got to know well throughout this series. We started episode one with Howard Rourke, and today we're going to be ending with Howard Rourke. Um, the reason for that is he is the hero of the novel, and we thought he deserved more attention than the others. And I think you'll find out the reasons for that as we go along. But one thing I wanted to say to you both is how Rourke, he doesn't really change, does he? And I think this is a really in, an, an important point. Although his experience of life changes dramatically throughout the novel, he's the most consistent character. And I, I see Andy nodding and I see Shoshana is ready to say and get stuck in. So um, maybe one of the two of you would like to start on, you know. Let me say something yeah, please real do. quick uh, before, and, let, and, and then let Shoshana you know, address your point, Josh. But beginning and ending with Howard Rock, I think Ayn Rand would approve because notice the first words of the novel law, Howard Rock laughed. And then the last words of the novel law, Dominique's rising up to see the, you know, there's nothing but the sky and the ocean and the figure of Howard Rock. So the name Howard Rock bookends, you know, the, the novel at, at, at both ends. And it's, it's just one indication of his heroism and his, and his, his dominance. Uh, but you're right, he doesn't change. I'm sure, uh, Shoshana, I'm sure you have a few things you want to say on that. Okay, well, I think it's completely true that in a very important sense, he doesn't change. That's one of the reasons why Stephen Mallory talks about him as the only one of us who is immortal because other people, you see them, you see them again, they've betrayed something, they have changed, which generally means deteriorating, but Rourke doesn't deteriorate. He's consistent, he's serene, he, he has integrity, he is what he always was. Now. On the other hand, I think it's fair to say that when we get to the last section of the book, that's the only one that's actually named for him. And the, the whole book, you know, the fountainhead, you could think of that as uh, Rourke as being the fountainhead, the source of everything, but the, you know, the fountainhead, uh, the source actually is individualism. And so interestingly, even though we do start the book with Howard Rourke and we end with Howard Rourke, this section is the one that's called Howard Rourke. And I think part of that is that he comes fully into everything that he is, and the novel does too, because this is the section in which he decisively wins. And I, I think that Rourke uh, wins spiritually, even when he doesn't win existentially, even when at the end of part two, his building is being distorted and mangled and you know, at the end of part one, um, Peter Keating won the contest with his name on it. And he's, uh, the woman he loves is married to Peter Keating. You know, that's again, someone else, something else that belongs to him that's got someone else's name on it. And then she marries Wynan, which is even worse. But even with all of that, he's, he's not beaten, but in this section, he gets everything, okay? He, he's got Dominique. It's clear to Dominique that the world belongs to him and to, and to her and not to Wynand. And he even wins at the trial because you could have the idea from earlier parts in the book that, you know, it's Howard Rourke against the world. Well, it may still be Howard Rourke against certain people in the world, even though that's not his focus. But, you know, at the trial, he picked the people with the hardest faces and they listen to what he says, and we're told that everyone in the courtroom hears what he says. So it's almost as if Rourke is like the writer, right? And we all hear, you know, Ayn Rand's written this book, and we've read the book, and people in the courtroom look at Rourke, and even before he says anything, they know what his essence is and what he says, and then he even says it. So it's not just pictures this time. So I, I think he doesn't change, but the book changes. And uh, it would be a very different book, I think, if we stopped after part one, or if we stopped after part two, or even if we stopped after part three, after, after having to, gotten to know Wynand. Because certainly after part three, we're expecting a clash, and we see how that works out. So, you know, he doesn't change in the sense of uh, having, 
he, oh, of course, his skills have improved. You know, he's a better architect. He learned from his own mistakes. He learned from working with Cameron. He learned from addressing different challenges. And he learned because that's part of what you do in your career is that you learn more and you do better. But it's not true that, um, that fundamentally he has to look back at his earlier self and say, well, that was wrong. He does say he shouldn't have helped Peter Keating. And he does think that he shouldn't have stayed as long as he did in school because, you know, he doesn't, he said that right to the Dean that he doesn't usually wait for things to happen to him. But these I think are relatively minor. And that if Rourke, as we know him at the end of the novel, we're looking at himself earlier, he'd, he'd recognize that basically spiritually, they are very much uh, the same person. So I guess that's what I would say about how he doesn't change. And yet uh, the book changes around him. You know, Shoshana, you, you raised a few interesting points. I wanted to, you know, about the title. A lot of people may not understand the title. I know my students never did, you know, and Fountainhead, of course, means original source. You know, they're like the fountainhead of the Nile rises up in the, in the mountain somewhere. And Ayn Rand showing us in the novel that the fountainhead of all human progress is independent judgment and the, the independent mind. And Howard Rourke, of course, exemplifies that brilliantly. And in his courtroom speech at the end, I think we already touched upon that. He says, you know, to Henry Cameron, to Stephen Mallory, to all these great thinkers in the past, many of whom were persecuted, all these, 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 these are the fountainhead. Um, but uh, yeah, Rourke, one interesting uh, perspective on, on the way, uh, Josh, I think you're right, that Rourke does not change his, um, certainly his basic cognitive methodology of independent judgment, the leitmotif of his character, uh, you know, and, and the theme of the book, you know, you know independence versus dependence. And what, how do Iron Man put it so brilliantly that the theme of the book is individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in men's souls. I mean, I, God, I mean, wow, well, I mean, that is a perfect, brilliant expression, you know, of what the book is about. Rock's cognitive MO remains the same, his independent judgment in all arenas of his life, his basic values remain the same, you know, his love of architecture, his love of, of, of Dominique, his love of, you know, his closest friends, Mike and Mallory and, and Wynan. Uh, Cameron, you know, Enright, you know, and, and so on. Uh, but one, one, one area where I think it's, it's really indicative is, and that is when I think it's Mallory asks him at, at some point about Dominique, he, he you know, he's, he says, are you, what, what are you waiting for? Are you, are you waiting for her to come back? And, you know, and he says, he's, Mallory, Mallory's excitable, right? Mall, Mallory says something about Mrs. Wine and Papers, God damn her. And Rock says very calmly, Steve, shut up, <laughs> you know, but he says, I'm not waiting. And I think there's the key here. He's, he's valuing, he's living out his values. He's doing what he loves to do. Um, preeminently, if, if I was religious, I would say, you know, th this is what Howard Rock was created to do. Uh, the relationship with Dominique is super important. The relationship with wine is super important, but fundamentally he's here to build. This is what he loves. He's not waiting. He's pursuing, he's pursuing his values. He never changes in that way. And you could see him going, just like Mallory says, if he lived to be as old as Methuselah, which was, you know, 900 and something years old, he's going to be building. <laughs> Maybe he'll retire, you know, in the last two years of 950 year life and, you know, and, and, and you know, live in one of his uh, apartment, one of his own buildings and just enjoy the beauty of his, of his buildings. But I could see him designing until the day he dies. So this is, this, this is who he is. Well, I, th I think it's true that um, Mallory says, you know, what are you waiting for? And Rourke tells him to shut up, which means he doesn't want to talk to Mallory about this. But it's also true that Rourke is correct, that it's, it's up to her, that he's not going to, he can't argue her into a different point of view. She has to use her own eyes, and she does. And then she arrives at where she is in the fourth part of the novel. I, th I think what is true is that he's not waiting in the sense that he's not broken by her and her mistake, which he recognizes when he sees her before her first marriage and her second marriage. And he's not even broken by what happens to Wynand, which of course is very painful. It's a pain unlike any other in his life and it's gonna be permanent, but it is what it is. You know, that's, that's reality. And I think that, yeah, what's, what's especially striking with Wynand is that he got to the point of understanding everything. And he understood that his way of life had led to the opposite of his values. And so 
you know, he understood more than Dominique did in the earlier part of the book about the world. And he sees, you know, the triumph of Rourke and Rourke is willing to still be his friend. And yet within him, he doesn't have the capacity. And you can't even say, well, why is that? It is, you know, that's, that's himself. And, you know, if this were a different novel and if he had another who knows how many years, I don't think it's impossible that Wynand could have recovered and redeemed himself, but in, in the way that Dominique did, you know, that it's not, failure is not final, but the fact that he's failed doesn't mean that Rourke has failed. He doesn't judge himself that way. He doesn't think, oh, gee, I failed to convince one. No, he did, he did what he could. He did his best. And as he did with Dominique earlier, and this is how things have worked out. Now, one thing that I think especially impresses me about looking at um, Rourke in the fourth part of the book versus the first part from the standpoint of did, did anything change? Well, when we came in, he had the question of the principle behind the dean. Okay, because he understands himself and the question is what's, what's going on with other people? What's the fundamental difference between the way I face the world and the way they face the world? And he's been understanding something of that as we go along, mentioned it to Stephen Mallory, but he has it in pure form when he and Wynand are on the boat, okay? Which of course is an argument in favor of having a sabbatical and time to think um, that um, he's, I mean, work is important to him, but here he actually identifies it and he and Wynand, as they're talking to each other, they're almost, you almost have to write down who's talking because they're both showing an understanding. And then, you know, Rourke says it. He says the principle behind the Dean, he's finally identified what's going on here. And then Wynan says this, you don't have to worry about me. I've sold myself, but I've held no illusions about it. I've sold my life, but I got a, pr a good price, power. I've never used it. I'm, I'm skipping some. Now I can use it for what I want, for what I believe, for Dominique, for you. And right there it says Rourke, looked, sorry, Rourke turned away. Now, that's not something that Rourke usually does. You know, what is this turning away? And, you know, what's, what's happening here is that he doesn't want to argue with Wynand, but he knows that Wynand's wrong. And for him, it causes pain that he sees that Wynand's wrong. And down the road, maybe Wynand's going to find out that he's wrong. And then the question is, what is he going to do about it? Because Wynand understands so much but he doesn't all the way understand about power, which is what Rourke says at the end. You know, that's the worst second hand to the one who goes after power. So I think Rourke here understands everything about the Dean and about Peter Keating. They talk about Peter Keating, they talk about Ellsworth Tui, and he understands about Wynand. And Wynand doesn't understand about himself, which is why we've still got some suspense and why as you've pointed out a number of times, Andy, it's wonderful that when Rourke stands up to receive the verdict of the court, Wine and stands up too, because what, he's on trial too. What a dramatic yeah. moment that is. And you're, and you're right, Shishan, it's a good point. Your work's intellectual growth here from puzzled about the, the, the principle behind the Dean to by the end of the Cortland trial, this principle of second handedness, he, is, he has grown over these years to, in, intellectually, his understanding has grown enormously. And I want to say something, you know, Ayn Rand, uh, where is it? I think it's in the early Ayn Rand where Leonard Peikoff points out that you know, the, what, what Ayn Rand focuses on in her writing is the role of values in, in human life. And that's really, that's very insightful. And, and the, the, the Fountainhead is, that's what it's, it's, it's all about. I, mem I remember telling my students many times, you could see, there's different ways you could summarize the Fountainhead. And, and one way, what's it about? Judgment, values, right? Go by your own judgment, form your own values and stick and stick to those values, pursue them, never betray them. And there's, there's what Rook, Shoshana, you're right. Rook takes a lot of hits in, in, in this story. Cameron dies, Dominique goes off and marries uh, his, 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 his worst enemies. Wynand is psychologically crushed, uh, but he keeps rolling like the proverbial river because his, he goes by his own judgment and he has values. The, the Fountainhead is just, what a great story about value pursuit and the role of values in, in, in human life. And the values are the great meaning maker and values are the great difference maker in human life. So I could be, 
I could lose the woman I love. You know, she might dump me for another guy or worse, she might die. You know, and that's going to be enormously painful. But if I have values like how it rock, I'm going to recover. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'll go through the mourning process. You see, Rock going to work with tears in his eyes, mourning this great loss, but going to work and designing, doing both, doing both. He's not wallowing, you know, in in the in in the pain, and he's not repressing it either, you know, and just being a workaholic. He's doing both. He's doing the morning and he's pursuing his values and the value pursuit gets, you know, the value, values are the meaning of life. And, and who better to embody that and illustrate it than Howard Rock. What a great creation by Ayn Rand, just for that alone, you know, to show the values are the meaning of life. Yeah, thank you, Ayn Rand. <laughs> what a and lesson. That, and Shoshana, I'm really pleased you brought up the principle of the Dean because the principle behind the Dean, because that was my introduction wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a trick question. But it was more, you know, how Walt doesn't change. No, he doesn't change, but he works out. And I, when I reread it most recently, well, actually, when I listened to audio form, that was my journey this time, was allowing myself to really discover the principle behind the Dean, you know. And this, this, the whole book takes you on that journey in many ways. It's one way of looking at it. And that, and it's always really, I, I always, when I think of how Walt, I always think of him in front of the Dean. I think of him putting the, if, if I were just sort of three or four moments that come up, it's the Dean, it's uh, seeing Tui in the street, it's showing the photographs, the judge, and then it's the speech at the end. And yeah, there's many other bits, but they're yeah. the, the ones that really, really, really stand out. And well, you know, it's, we, it's yeah. so powerful, you see, because also he's someone who doesn't always think in words. You know, he thinks in his drawings. And so I, I think that the, there's some sense in which he may have grasped the principle, but not had the words for it. And now now he he has the words. And Wynan, of course, he's someone of words. You know, he's a he's a writer. And um, it's one of the things Dominique says, well, wow, you're, you're a really good writer, um, which he's not been. And, and that's that's, again, part of Wynan's power that he recovers his ability to use his words. Right, I mean, that's that great passage where he, after Tui has written the harmful editorial and he just can't wait, you know, he's, he's restless. He can't do anything until he sits down to write the words that would contradict Tui. And then well, Ayn Rand says, you know, there's, there's such a power in words for later for those who read them, but first for the one who finds the words. Well, I think that Wynan finds the words and, um, and Rourke also finds the words. And, and, but of course, uh, as you know, Wynan also loses the words when the editorial comes out and that he didn't write and he looks at it to see what he had written, meaning it's got someone else's name on it. I mean, it's other people's words with his name on it, which is what would never happen to Rourke, it, you know, by his own choice with his own words, even though his buildings are out there with other people's names on them. So it's you know it's it, it's it's an it's a really interesting development what happens to Rourke in that by the end everything is together for him and integrated and no one else is mangling anything of his no one else is stealing anything of his no one else has anything of his even Winant Winant doesn't belong to the banner anymore you know he's lost his friend or it looks as if he's lost his friend but it's not as if his friend has gone anywhere, has affirmed a loyalty anywhere else, or um, he's just dead, you know, this wine and wine is no longer there. But it's not that, um, it's not as if Rourke's got any unfinished business in the sense of I didn't do what I needed to do to save my friend. He did everything. And now he's building the biggest building. And if, and it's one more thing that Wynan did is he gave him that building. You know, he, he couldn't, give him a friendship of equals because Wynan didn't have that in him, but he's got the, he's got the money, he's got the power to give Rourke his biggest job. And that's what Rourke is doing, his biggest job. You know, the tallest right. building. Right, and although, you're right, Shoshana, although Wynan is not spiritually Rourke's equal, he's, part of him is the closest to it, which makes, you know, of anybody in the story, which makes possible the, the, the Wynan building. Um, 
That's but, right. Um, you're the you're the one encounter in my life that can never be repeated. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he says that yeah. to Winant. Good point. He says that to Winant, not to even to Dominique. He says that to Winant. Oh, you remember Dominique? With Dominique, he said he said if I have to go to jail, you should stay with Winant. I mean, right. what? I don't yeah, think that would have happened. I mean, what well, what is that? But um, I mean, I think yeah, that raises. Yeah. A really I mean, that, that's 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 up to that's up to Dominique. You know, he's not. Oh the yeah, one sure. Telling her, that yeah. raises a really interesting point. Also, uh, you know, why does Rock regard the relationship with Wine and rather than the romantic love of his life as the the one, you know, uh, experience that that could never be repeated? I think I, I'm just guessing here. But I think what what Ayn Rand is showing us here is that you know. Rational human beings know the value of romantic love. And, and you could expect that you would have this kind of relationship. Rock could expect that he would have this kind of relationship with this kind of a woman. But the spiritual soulmate relationship that goes deeper even than brothers, I don't know, same gender, non-romantic, profound love relationship. That's much, I think that's rare, you know, relative. A lot of people have real romantic love in their life, and that's great. I'm all, I'm all in favor of that. Uh, but to have the kind of soulmate relationship that Rock and Winant has, you know, they love each other. It's, it's, it's not romantic. In fact, obviously, they're in love with the same woman. But, you know, it is unique. It's rare. It's special. And I think that's, I think that's what Rock is, uh, you know, is, is referring to. It says it's very rare. And but, uh, especially, especially since it's not as if they're ticking off the boxes of common interests. You know, no one would ever match up the two of them. Uh, each of them thought of the other one as the opposite. So that's what's so interesting is that they, right. when they see each other, they see that their souls are yeah, comrades. Right. Rock goes into that first meeting prepared to tell Wynan to go stick it, you know, and yeah. then he's, but there's like their, their souls meet midway in the room and they just bond. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's really is, it really is special what Ayn Rand is showing us. And, and you know, it's funny, Shoshan and Josh, because Ayn Rand's enemies say she's cold and she has no human feelings and doesn't care about humanity. And here she's showing us an intimacy, uh, you know, same gender, non-romantic love relationship that is just so special. And the critics just, just miss it. They're either blind or they're willfully, willfully blind. But I wanted to say something, it reminds me, uh, I've, I've had several friends read the book, you know, on my recommendation and, and really, you know, they, they, they like it. They agree with the, with the, the, the thematic content. They, you know, they, they, they recognize the brilliance of the plot and what a great hero Howard Rock is. But I've often heard people say, ah, oh, you know, it's like, it's kind of depressing. You know, he's fighting the whole world. He's all alone and, and everything. And I said, what, <laughs> what did you read? You know, Howard Rock is all alone. He's got more close friendships. I mean, close, not just, you know, superficial relationships. Well, you know, with Mike and Mallory and Cameron and Roger Renwright and Anthony Cord and, you know, Kent Lansing and, you know, and Gail Wine and not to mention Dominique. He's got- and Austin, uh, you know, don't forget Austin Heller. Yeah, Austin Heller. Yeah, th th thank you. Uh, he's got more close relationships you know, in like in, in a matter of months or a couple of years than most human beings have in their entire life from from grade school to, you know, to to deathbed. And they're all at they're all at Rock's trial at the end. They're all there. You know, they all recognize even Guy Franken by the end of the story is like, oh, this, Dominique, I think you got the right guy this time. You know, you know, I'm, I'm, and he goes and sits on stands up. Was, is that the first time in his life that Guy Franken has stood up to, you know, to all of his clients and his colleagues and everything and, and, and gone on his own and in, in independently in his own direction to sit on Howard Rock's side of the courtroom? I mean, Rock's got a, practically a battalion of, of people who are close to him. I don't, I don't get this point that, uh, you know, that, that he's, well, it's just false. It's a mistake. He's, he's not alone. Um, maybe people are... Uh, uh, mistaken because they recognize Rock's independent spirit can be serene and joyful, even if he doesn't have these close relationships because of his fundamental valuing. And here's the last point I wanted to make on this about the valuing when he's, when the hell of house is going off, you know, he's like, He's, he's whatever the work is, like, oh, look at this guy. He's in love with this thing. He can't keep his hands off. Yeah, that's it. He's so in love with building. He's, if 
I don't think, you know, he, I don't think, you know, obviously he wouldn't want to be alone on an island like the Tom Hanks character in Castaway or like Robinson Crusoe. But if he were alone on an island, he's the guy preeminently who could make it happen, who could build a house and find food, you know, and, and, and make it happen. And be lonely without a doubt, without human companionship, might end up talking to a, a volleyball like, you know, the Tom Hanks character does. But still is a serenity of his soul and it's and that I would be, I think, would remain unflustered, unruffled, but it's just grounded in his relationship with reality, his relationship with nature, his focus on nature rather than society, his focus on building rather than other people. Other people are a great boon. Um, they well, can be, if other, uh, and if and, and and if other people want him or want his work, that's a compliment to them, but it doesn't affect his view of himself. Right. Yeah. yeah you know, right. Which is which, of course, is how he's different from Tui because Tui needs his fans. You know, yeah, Tui, that's why that great scene. Uh, yeah, that, Tui that scene. feeds on sores he collects. Right. You that know, scene, that scene, the one time they meet is so monumentally insightful on, on mm -hmm. Ayn Rand's part. Uh, Tui absolutely craves some kind of recognition from Rock. And as far as Rock goes, Tui could live or die. He doesn't, he's not even yeah. part of Rock's worldview. You know, yeah. He... And, uh, and I think that, well, you know, Rourke consider, you know, he says, those who want me will come to me and that it's a compliment to them if they value his work right. rather than, yeah. And, 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 uh, and so because he so clearly is what he is, people do recognize his work, the ones who want it and do come to him. Right. And uh, I think it's very powerful that at the end he wins at the trial, whether or not you think that that would actually happen in this book, it happened. You know, in, in this book, he's, he stood up and they saw who he was and he said what he was and he said what he thought. Well, that's exactly and, uh, right. And that's what they wanted. In 1938, they 1938 and 1940, it might have happened. In 2020, I, I think they'd probably put Brock in, in, in prison, unfortunately. But well, I, I wanted to this, go ahead. Go this, ahead is where, what, this is where I wanted, you know, Shoshana keeps preempting me. That I think it's really important we discuss the, the trial and, and yeah. maybe discuss what it was like for the two of you to read it for the first time. The Cortland trial, you mean? The, you know, not the, the, the finale. Not the, start of Temple, not the start of Temple trial. You mean the Cortland trial? Yeah, the Cortland yeah. trial. You know, the climax trial, you know, yeah. the, it's the first time we're into, I was introduced to Ayn Rand's ability of summing things up in a, in a speech, you know. And, sort of, and I remember being well, very, 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 very moved, excited, proud to have got that far through the book and, you know, proud to be part of this story um, it, it it affected me on many different levels. That the the that um, the, the whole trial and and Rourke's speech, but I'm I'm curious to hear what the two how the two of you maybe first responded to that, and not just the first time, but when well, you reread it as well. Sure. Well, for one thing, I think it's it's well written and it is not too long. You might say that uh, it could have been longer. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's it's condensed. Uh, Part of what I especially like about it is that he's giving this speech on purpose because he's on trial on purpose because he didn't have to be caught. Okay, that's that's what you know. He destroyed Cortland because it was an abomination, but he did it in the way that he did it, in a way so that he would be caught and would be able to make this statement. And the statement is part of his statement, you know, his statement of principle, but it's a referendum on his world because he says, all right, you know, if, 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 if I lose, then um, fine, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to prison, that'll be an act of um, allegiance. And he doesn't even say, I'll think that I failed or anything like that, but he doesn't think it's gonna work that way. It's almost as if it's, it's a last act of demonstration to Wynand. Okay, I can do this and I will save myself my way because he is who he is. And, there is one thing about the speech that um, I, I, I think pertains to himself and makes it his speech as opposed to say a speech that another character might give. And that's where he talks about the creator. Because in fact, you know, the, uh, the individual versus the collective, there's a sense in which every first hander is a creator, but not all first hand, -hand people are creative geniuses as he is. And people who are not geniuses are also individuals and are also entitled to their own lives. And it's important for them to have their own values. But 
because he actually is creative and is a genius. And to some extent, he doesn't want to say, well, I'm just talking about myself. He talks about the principle as it applies to him. But it's also true, it applies to Mike, who's not a creative giant genius, that he also can be a man of principle who does what, what, who goes by his own judgment, sees with his own eyes, and does what his principles uh, tell him to do. So I, I think that Rourke is talking about the creator because he's a creator, but yeah, that's part of how the speech works. It's his speech about everything he knows, about everything in the world, and about himself and himself in this moment. Because sometimes, you know, it almost sort of takes you aback when he talks about the bozos who mangled his building. You might have forgotten, oh yeah, we're here about a building because he's been talking about the whole world and, and what is it? he says how many there are and, and, and how many well lots of you know he's he's had a whole perspective of history and over generations and centuries there is this battle has been engaged but it's also happening right now and that of course is why he's in this trial so it's both uh, the specific and the concrete and the timely and the general and the abstract and the timeless, all of those coming together in what work has to say here. So I, I, I don't, well, it's, it's of course uh, a phenomenal piece of writing um, on Ayn Rand's part, but it also I think is credible that Rourke after everything, and since he's had time to think about it, since he planned this, is capable of delivering this speech. It's something that always sort of puzzles me. Sometimes when you see, a, I don't know, a musical and the characters are singing songs and the songs are very articulate and you think that character couldn't use those words. You know, that happens sometimes. Well, he can use these words. You know, of course they're Ayn Rand's words, but it's also his own situation and even from his own point of view as the creator. Yeah, yeah you know, and Shoshana, um, I think one reason why as much as I, generally like Gary Cooper as an actor and, uh, you know, certainly think he deserved the two best actor awards that he won. He, he wasn't the guy to utter these words, you know, in the, in, in the courtroom. And I, I, to me, was part of the reason why I, I, I don't like the, the, the movie very much. Uh, all this is my all time favorite book, but that's another story for, for another day. We could discuss the movie. Um, but um, yeah, I first read, the Fountainhead when I was 16 and I was and uh, that summer where I turned 17 and I read Atlas Shrugged right after I read The Fountainhead and what struck me in the in the courtroom speech was um, was just how philosophical it was I, I mean I was too young to really be that philosophical yet but I was interested in philosophic issues you know and, and literature and history were always my favorite subjects and part of the reason I, lo I love them was a, is that about human beings and human beings you know role in the world and the kind of world in, in in which they live and it raises all kinds of what I found out later well metaphysical and epistemological questions and the metaphysics that Ayn Rand discusses here and and, and the epistemology um, that independence re what re really means is you know we talk about going by your own judgment at, at the most fundamental level, what it means is it, it's an orientation towards reality, not towards society. It's an orientation towards nature, and and you see this in in Rock right from the right from the start when he he's, he <laughs> what gets his mind off the principle of the dean. You know, he leaves the he leaves the office, yeah. he sees the the sunlight striking the stone, he immediately thinks he forgets about the dean and the and and the principal and the people you know, the, the depredations of the Dean and people like Dean, the Dean, his focus is on nature, what I could do with that stone, what I could build with it, you know, and you see, it, it, it's more of an effort for what to think about people because he's so, he's so focused on reality, so focused on nature and the, and the creative act. And I think we already discussed, this is the guy, you know, the kind of guy who figured out how to, you know, to, how to grow crops and cure diseases and, you know, and so on and so forth. How to, this is the kind of guy who was developing a vaccine for the coronavirus. You know, somebody, you know, those who can do, right? Those who can focus on reality and, 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 and they create. And other people are important without a doubt, but they're secondary. Even Dominique, even Cameron, even Wynan, they're important, but they all know it. And they all, they all know, you know, 
uh, I've had this discussion with students, you know, especially with adults, and some of the people are not comfortable. You know, he, he loves Dominique deeply, but she's second to architecture. You know, she she knows that, uh, and 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 she accepts part of what she loves about him. Uh, you know that that the architecture and and the, and the creative act and, and it comes first. And Ayn Rand showing us a human being's most fundamental relationship is with reality. We have to be able to create and grow in order to 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 live in in the world. Other relationships with other people are important but secondary. I think that's true. It's a feature of the novel. And since you were commenting on the film, I. I think one feature of a feature length film, you know, a two hour movie is that Ayn Rand did have to make it more about some of the people and not, especially given that Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't gonna be doing the models for them and less about the architecture. So I, I think that's maybe um, people who are confused, maybe you're looking at the movie and not remembering just how much Howard Rourke loves architecture. And that he really loves building, and look what it's like when he gets that done. You know, you know that he's he's in love with the building, and um, he's in love with the building as he builds it, and he's in love with the with the process of building, and he's always happy. You know, just um, which doesn't mean that he's always um, perfect in uh, morally perfect, of course, but not not that his you know he does a lot of bad drafts that end up in the wastebasket. Mm -hmm. And yet that's all, that's part of the process of getting it right. Part of, part of the process of getting the building the way that he wants it is being active and recognizing what's wrong with his own drafts and then putting them away. That's, he doesn't have to get it right the first time in order to get it right ultimately and in time and, and in order, order to build. Yeah, I, I think that part of what's very, very satisfying as we see the grown up Howard Rourke is indeed what Andy is saying about how he's got, you know, a, a world full of values and the values and, and all the values are depend on who he is. The people whom, who admire him and whom he likes, well, what he likes about them, he talks about a certain stamp on someone's face is that uh, they care about the things that matter to him. You know, it's not an accident. You know, they're it's all chosen. Right. At some level, they recognize, whether, whether it's explicit or implicit, they recognize, I think Ayn Rand's point, that our fundamental relationship is with reality, and they really respect and admire the guy who preeminently can deal with reality and make uh, human life possible, make flourishing life possible. This is what Dominique loves about him. Uh, if he were to put it into words, he doesn't need to because she gets it. But if he were to put him to words, he'd say, Dominique, you're the most important human being in my universe. You're the most important human being, human being by far. But building comes first. She knows that. It's what she loves about him. <laughs> and some people, I mean, Dominique's self-esteem is strong. So she, she, she could be the most important person in his life, but, but second to architecture. Somebody else whose self-esteem was not as strong as hers you know, would not be the right woman. Uh, well, which is of course why when she makes her ridiculous suggestion that um, right. they should live by themselves and give up our architecture, ha ha ha, you know, that's right. not gonna work. Right. Yeah, that, 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 that would not work at all. And no. yeah, and, and, and he knows that even if, if she doesn't because um, it's her way of saying, well, maybe that's a way I can protect you. And he says, no, no, no. what would you be protecting? Right. Would be left you'd, of me. You'd be miserable in in some show. I don't remember what time period yeah. he's. Best for. You'd be you'd be miserable. You, you wouldn't yeah. be happy with me if I. You know, it's not the guy you love, Dominic. She knows. She she knows that. Uh, right. But you know, it reminds me in the in the movie Ray, the the you know biopic about Ray Charles, where he's, he's in trouble with the law. I think he was on, on drug charges or something. His wife says to him, Ray. She says they'll take away something from you, meaning the government will take away something from you that's far more precious to you than I am or the children. Your music, Ray, they'll take away your music. Same, you know, same principle, the, the, you know, she, Mrs. Charles in this case recognizes who her husband is. The music, he loves her, he loves the kids without a doubt, but music comes first. And it's, it's that kind of a soul, that creative, that creative mind who can build and grow and you know and create and 
make flourishing human life on this earth possible. Ayn Rand said her philosophy is a philosophy for living on earth. Well, it's the Howard Rock types, the independent men whose orientation is towards nature, not towards society or other people. They're the ones preeminently who, who, who make it possible for us to flourish on, on this earth. And Howard Rock's courtroom speech is a salute to them. He's a, it's a salute across the ages. Just like, just like equality Prometheus thinks about, you know, all the, those creative spirits in the past, you know, uh, who, who, who made possible these great things and were killed by the communists or Nazis or whatever. And he says a salute across the ages to, the, to those minds, those independent minds focused on reality who made, it, who made flourishing human life possible. Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's literary corpus is an ode to those minds from one of the greatest of that type of minds to... To these, to these great minds who make human life possible. There's the person who doesn't care about human life, right? Um, but uh, yes, she's, she is saluting, you know, in this courtroom speech and elsewhere in her corpus, the great minds who make possible flourish your life. And it's just, it's just so moving. It was moving to me at 16 and it's just as moving, you know, to me now. Yeah. And I think, I think we should end on the very last scene of the novel. I know we've touched on it a few times, but... I think it's we should conclude this with that yeah, the very symbolism. last scene. The okay. symbolism. So Can I just say life. something before we yeah, get please, to please you know, do, Dom, do, yeah. Dominic showing up? That does tie everything together, but in a way, it's a kind of epilogue because yeah. we've had a, a little time jump to you know from the 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 end of the novel proper, and now she this is almost it's almost like a coda. And what I think. Uh, goes with it. Of course, we, we talk about Cameron, we talk about building, we find out that she's Mrs. Rourke, which means that she's, she's married to him as she was married to other people, but that she's his counterpart. But what I, I think is especially powerful is that um, we've already had the scene in which she chose to unite herself to him when she went to Mananic Valley. And, you know, and that was their, their, um, you know, romantic reunion, right? I mean, she had, um, and I think that that's a that's a really wonderful scene in the book, because everybody talks about their first sexual union, right? You know, the the so-called rape scene, and this this time, well, they're not at her place with him arriving unexpectedly, but not undesired. But uh, here she's going to his place, and he's of course glad to see her. But the whole description is so different. You know, I mean, it's. Well, you know, it's uh, it's because of everything that's happened in between and everything that they both understand, which was implicit in the earlier scene in spite of all of her errors and misunderstandings. And now they're together. Okay, and then she does her own Cortland, you know, uh, blowing up the marriage uh, publicly for wine. And, and now we've got this, you know, we've, we've, we've got this wonderful, wonderful sequence in which she rises above, above everything. You know, above the courthouses, we're done with those courthouses. Above the churches, above all the buildings, and I think even the very fact that he's up there means that he feels confident being up there. He's not afraid. Not like you know, Ellsworth Tui. He he looks at Rourke and he thinks of himself falling out of the window and hitting the ground and what his body would look like. Rourke's not worried about falling. You know, this is his strong building. He knows every bit of it, and he's now everything. You know the the ocean and the sky and the figure of Howard Rourke. So I, I and as you say, it's um it's an image, and we started with an image and we end with an image. Right, and the symbolism yeah. the symbolism is so powerful. Uh, first of all, you have Mrs. Rourke, you know, rising up to m meet the man she loves, and he's waiting for the you know the 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 woman he loves. But like the, like Shoshana says, she, she he she rises above. All these social institutions, the courts, the churches, the government, government offices, uh, the social institutions ruled by Ellsworth Tui. And she rises until, uh, and she's rising above them uh, until she sees, you know, there's nothing but the ocean, the sky, and the figure of Howard Rock. There's nothing but nature and the man who can deal with nature. And uh, I ran symbolism. Uh, the story dramatizes this point. 
the courtroom speech expresses it in a philosophic speech. And then if you didn't get it, guys, here, I'll show you, I'll show you the symbolism. It's just so integrated. It's, it's so perfect. Here's the man who can deal with reality. Here's the man who can deal with nature. Here's the man who preeminently can make flourishing human life possible. And Dominique loved this guy. She sensed this about him from the first time she saw him in the granite quarry. And she loves him for exactly that reason. And here she's, as now, years later, after a painful struggle, or well, a struggle anyway, uh, she's just, as his wife, she's a, a, a said thing to him, you know, and this, it, it wraps up the story at so many levels. Rourke wins the battle and gets the girl, you know, <laughs> and of course, Ayn Rand's uh, philosophic point is, is, has been dramatized in the story, it's been expressed in this courtroom speech, and now it's symbolized you know, in the imagery here, yeah, it's just right. It's, and it's yeah, and it's it's just very in your face because, you know, Dominique, uh, we heard, you know, she told us the story about um, the statue that she had, which she cherished, and she threw it out of the window to break it. Well, it didn't break, right? That's that's Rourke. She can't break him. But you know, that's sort of the image of, you know, Dominique up here throwing something down. And then when she actually meets Rourke, He's in the quarry down there. She's up here looking down at him. You know, and there's the drama of that. And now he's up there and she's going there to meet him. And so instead of, you know, looking down or trying to break someone, it's that, you know, the two of them are, she's, she's going to get close enough that she'll be up there too. Right. And right. yeah, she's up there too. Yeah, she is. She has ascended, not just physically here, but she's ascended spiritually. She has thrown off that malevolent society view that's, that has held her back. And now she realizes there are a lot of good people in the world and, you know, and they deserve Howard Rock and Howard Rock's going to succeed and on his own terms. And you, know, you mentioned before, so Dominique has ascended spiritually, but more so than physically. But I want to wrap this up. I know, Shoshana, you mentioned before the really good point about Tui looking out the window and feeling he's gonna he's gonna you know fall and, and be crushed and of course Ayn Rand showing us again here's the guy who's Tui preeminently a terrified of reality he, he just he just can't, he won't face it he's, a, he's an intelligent guy if he had made be better choices when he was young he might have been you know a, a, a different kind of different kind of person but he didn't and uh, he's terrified of reality and so he, he, he feels he can't deal with it you know and, he, and so so he can't deal with it and so he's a power luster. He's, you know, as Howard Rourke says, you know, there's two ways to survive in the world. You can, you know, conquer nature or you can conquer those who conquer nature. And to ease the virus, try to get into the souls of, you know, of human beings. He can conquer those. He can control those who can conquer nature nature and the laws of the law of gravity the laws of nature just terrify him he can't firsthand he can't first handedly face it he won't first handedly face it and this is why his whole his whole universe is is social and Ayn Rand he's completely non-creative I mean I, I, he literally I don't think he could hammer nails into a piece of wood to make a, a crude chair or a table he's completely uncreative he's a, completely a power loss he can't deal with nature or, or reality firsthand at all. And so he's got to try and deal with it secondhand through by conquering other people. And, and Ayn Rand, it's a, it's a small scene, but Shoshana, you're right, it's an important scene because it tells us, again, it, it symbolizes, you know, what, what Ayn Rand is showing us about, about Tui. And it's, 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 again, Ayn Rand, brilliantly done, subtly and brilliantly done. I think it's also powerful that this end scene, we don't have to even think about all those other people, right. you know, Wine, it's the wine and building, but but he's he's not in the story. Two, he's not in the story. Peter Keating, forget Peter Keating. You know, he's not in the story. It's it's the building, the people working on it, and these two together up there. You know where they belong. These yeah. two independent souls. Yeah, yeah. lovely. And not, and what a fantastic place for us to end, guys. I um really really enjoyed and got a huge amount of value from listening to the two of you I, you know i describe it as riffing but it's much more than riffing and, well, and uh and now read the book again because yeah, yeah. you always get more when you read the book I've, i'm 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 torn do i reread that or do i reread the living or do i reread atlas we'll we'll have to we, we shall see but it's been well, it's, it's been, a tough tough life josh i know, you know <laughs> so she was high, high, high class problems yeah, right. Right. yeah yeah absolutely right. but it's been a it's been a real pleasure and i like and your questions thank you i like and, your questions and i thank look forward you. to 
seeing you all soon and uh and i'm really looking forward to the feedback that we're going to get from this as well i know it's been very positive so far and it's been a real pleasure to do and thank you for razi for putting it together as well so thank thanks very much and i want thank to you, thank you andy yeah thank you shoshana for your insights yes. and, and josh for your you know for hosting this and the questions and and razi for putting it on this has been a great series